Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Mirrorwood Center program today, The Signed in Silk. And I am going to turn this over to Stephen so he can continue with the introduction and welcoming our guest today. Thank you so much. It's really a joy and a pleasure to welcome everyone on behalf of the Mirrorwood Center and to thank you all for joining us this morning. It's my enormous pleasure right now to introduce to you our two guests for this program, first of whom is Jenny Kortinovis, who is the Andrew F. W. Mellon Foundation's Assistant Curator of Decorative Arts and Design. She has curated and co-curated several installations and exhibitions at our St. Louis Art Museum, including St. Louis Modern, Blow Up, Graphic Abstraction in 1960s Design, The Bauhaus and Its Legacy, Cross Pollination, Flowers on 18th Century Porcelain and Textiles, Printing the Pastoral, Visions of the Countryside in 18th Century Europe, and most recently, the exhibition we're going to be discussing today, Signed in Silk, Introducing a Sacred Jewish Textile. Ginny holds a master's degree in the history of decorative arts, design and material culture from the Bard Graduate Center and a bachelor's degree in art history with honors from Barnard College both in New York City. I'm also delighted to welcome back to our program at the Mirrored Center, Bill Sitzer, who has been an active docent at the St. Louis Art Museum since 2014 and is a past chair of its docent board. He has given hundreds of tours and has collaborated with museum staff and community partners in the development of its interfaith tour initiative and program. He currently serves as a regional director to the National Docent Symposium Council. He is a retired lawyer, a lifelong amateur violinist, and a passionate chamber musician. And we're delighted and honored to have you both with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. Does everybody see a beautiful to our art yes. curtain in front of them. Perfect. Okay. Um, so thank you, Stephen and Judith and everybody at the Mirrorwood Center. This is really such an honor. I'm thrilled to be here um, to tell you more about this extraordinary object, which is the centerpiece of the exhibition Signed in Silk, Introducing a Sacred Jewish Textile, which is on view now at the St. Louis Art Museum until early October. And I'm especially grateful to have Bill Sitzer here as my partner during this talk. Um, he's really been a tremendous supporter of the exhibition, has posed very, many important questions and just really added a lot of wonderful context and information. So thanks, thank you, Bill. So this embroidered tour or curtain or prokhet was made by Simhavi Terbo in the year 5,515 or 1754-55 in the Gregorian calendar in Ancona, Italy. The St. Louis Art Museum purchased the curtain at auction in 2019 with the Deanne and Paul Schatz Endowment Fund for Judaica, which was established by the Schatzes to bring the best Jewish ceremonial art to local audiences. So in addition to celebrating the Terbo and her artistry, the exhibition uses the museum's varied encyclopedic collection of textiles to illuminate her material world and better understand why this object looks the way it does. So Bill and I will bounce back and forth throughout the presentation, which should run about a little less than an hour. Uh, we'll begin by introducing Simha and her Torah curtain. We'll dive into the history of the Jewish community in Ancona and Italian Judaica more generally. And finally, we'll consider Simha's possible sacred and secular artistic influences. So although the curtain had been published and exhibited at major museums in New York, Paris, and Jerusalem, the identity of the maker had not yet been established when Slam purchased the curtain at Sotheby's. So my first research task was to find the life dates and home of this particular Simhavi Terbo, because there are a few living in the 18th century. Thankfully, I was able to do this virtually, primarily under COVID lockdown, thanks to a crowdsourced genealogical website called My Heritage, the Central Archives for the History of the Jewish People in Jerusalem, where the uh, most of the Jewish community of Ancona's archives are held. Research from the economic historian Luca Andrioni, um, who is, he did most of his research in the Ancona Municipal Archives. He's really an economic scholar based in Ancona and the writing of Simha's own son. And then of course, through Simha's own words on the curtain itself, which I'll show you right now. 
So as you can see here, the bottom edge of the curtain is embroidered handwork of the young woman, Samhavi Turbo, in the year of the straight and the good. And this inscription was translated with the help of several people, including um, uh, Sharon Mintz, who's a, a curator at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, and, a, and a few others. Um, so it's it was there are a few kind of interesting parts about it. One is that she uses the double appellation Habashara Mara, which is a mix of Bashara meaning young woman and Mara meaning Mrs. And this amongst Italian Jewry suggests that she's a young unmarried woman. So this gives us some clue of who she might have been when she made this. And then the date, interestingly, which some of you may know this already, but when I when I discovered this system of um, uh, Jewish numerology, I was really excited. So this, the date is given as a chronogram and can be understood using, again, this geometry system of Jewish numerology by which a letter in the Hebrew alphabet corresponds to a numerical value. And you see this quite frequently on texts. So the curtain uses the marks above the letters that should be counted, so they're right here. In this case, Yashar equals 515 with the 5,000 implied and then this translates in the Gregorian calendar to 1754-55, roughly. So she would have been about 15 or 16 when she made this object, quite young. So the winning Simha, so to speak, was born on June 10th, 1739 to Solomon Moise Viterbo, and she died on June 8th in 1779. Her father was a rabbi, a small scale wool importer and a student of the famous physician and rabbi Samson Morpurgo. Simha married Mordecai and had at least three children, her first in 1764 and her last child in 1767. Only one of these children survived. She died at the age of 40, leaving a 12 year old son, Vitali, or Yekiahim Viterbo, who would go on to become a noted rabbi and poet. And here you can see above is her birth um, uh, record. Oh, that's actually her death record, I apologize, in the, um, that was found uh, or that is kept uh, um, in Israel at, um, in the um, Center for the Central Archives of the History of the Jewish People. And here is a, a sort of abbreviated family tree for her. So you can see she's boxed out in red. Her father, Salman Moisey, she marries Mordecai, who was also a Viterbo. He, his mother was all, probably a Morpurgo, um, so he may have been distantly related to Samson Morpurgo. Um, and then you can see her, her children, Ferna, who we don't know what died, but probably is an infant. Um, and then she had another son who um, you know, died as a three-year-old, presumably, and then her, um, her surviving son, um, Yeki Alhin, who went on to marry Rachel Prado. And this is actually their ketubah. Um, she was not alive uh, to witness her son uh, Mary, she died when she was 40. But um, this is the ketubah that survives at the Jewish Theological Seminary, marking that marriage. The other object that we know um, that her family owned, and this is the only other object we know her family owned or, you know, um, was in their possession, is this book. Um, this is the title page um, because it's actually inscribed by her father. So this is, um, this title page is from Bragandino, which was a Venetian printer uh, of Hebrew books in the 17th and 18th centuries. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to thank Jenny uh, for this opportunity to join her in this presentation. Um, our entire community uh, owes her a real debt of gratitude for curating this exhibition and for uh, discovering all of this wonderful information uh, about the artist Simha Bitterbo uh, all the research and gathering of information she did uh, to bring uh, Simha to light. Uh, and by the way, the exhibition will be on view uh, in the museum until early October. And we hope that many of you will uh, get the opportunity to see it and feel safe enough to be able to go and to see it. So, um, uh, So why is the curtain an embroidery? And why is its central motif a grapevine? 
the book of Exodus states that the Torah Ark curtain shall be embroidered by a skilled craftsman, an embroiderer. Simcha, the artist, used beautiful elaborate designs, flowers, and abstractions on this curtain. And she used a variety of silk and metallic threads, pressed metal strips, spiral wire, and sequins. It's a tour de force of embroidery, covering a shimmering azure blue silk background. It's 87 inches by 66 inches. That's more than eight by six feet. The curtain itself is very large. And this image on your left is the central mo motif uh, of a grapevine. Jewish texts suggest reasons why Simha might have chosen a grapevine as her central motif. Grapes and wine are important symbols in Jewish tradition and ritual. The vine is a symbol of the tree of life and represents Jerusalem and Torah. Proverbs states that Torah is a tree of life to those who grasp her and whoever holds onto her is happy. The twisted pillars in Baroque synagogues often include grapevines entwined around such pillars and a cluster of grapes often appears as a decoration in many mosaic floors. So the grape, the vine and wine are all important symbols in Jewish ritual practice. Wine is used in many life cycle events including circumcision, the wedding service itself, and the Sheva Brachot, the seven, seven blessings following the wedding. It's part of the weekly Jewish calendar, every seventh day on the Sabbath, which separates the day of rest from the rest of the week. The, the Kadush blessing is made over the wine, as well as during the Havdalah, the ceremony which closes the Sabbath. Wine signifies sanctification, marking Shabbat as holy and elevating the meal and the service to a higher plane. Wine is also an essential part of many other Jewish holidays. The fruit of the tree of wisdom is described as bunches of grapes on a vine. The children of Israel are referred to as a vine. Deuteronomy describes grapevine as one of seven species with which the land of Israel was blessed. In Numbers, the spies sent ahead of the Israelites to report on the land of Canaan, brought back from the valley of Hebron, a cluster of grapes of remarkable size. So there would have been lots of reasons why Simcha chose the grapevine as the centerpiece of her parochette. In addition, which is this has been posited by um, by Sharon Mintz, is that um, vite is grapevine in Italian, and viterbo, of course, has that same um, root. And so it's possible that the reason that also, in addition to all these wonderful, you know, religious significance and biblical significance, that that it also possibly is a reference to her family itself, which is possibly why it also. Um, appears on the armorial of the ketuba of her son, um, but of course also grapes were used, as Bill mentioned, as you know, as a symbol for uh, of joining the two families in a marriage. So, um, so one of the most exciting discoveries I have to say of the exhibition was this text. I mean, in addition to the um, to the textile itself. Um, so this is a passage from an introduction to a book written by Simha's son in 1818. And it was published in Rashi script, uh, a Sephardic script, as many of you know, typically used in rabbinical treaties. And so it was only with the great help of colleagues at Washington University that I was really able to um, understand this touching tribute. Um, and I have to say, when I received the translation, I was with my husband and I literally jumped up and down <laughs> for, for great joy. <laughs> um, you know, for three reasons. So the first was that it confirmed that Simha the Simha that I had found with these birth and death dates was the right Simha, right? So her life dates perfectly triangulate with her son's life dates as well. 
it gave a glimpse into who she was as a person, you know, a devoted and beloved mother. And it celebrated her outstanding artistry with works of art, embroidery in silver and in gold, more valuable than pearls for the grandeur of the sanctuary and the court. I mean, that's just absolute research gold <laughs> um, and was just really exciting to read. Um, there's not much, although Jewish women are honored in, a, in an Italian, in a prayer in the Italian rite, um, or making textiles for the synagogue, they are not often referred to in text by name associated with these textiles. So this was really a great discovery. And Phil's going to tell you a little bit more about the, um, the biblical allusions present in the text as well. So as I'm sure many of you know, one of the most famous passages in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, is the Eshet Chayil, the woman of valor, Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, much of Simcha's son's tribute, uh, which is shown here, is based on these passages of Proverbs. It's believed that the book of Proverbs was written by King Solomon and that the verses of the woman of valor either address the ideal qualities of a wife or are a tribute to Solomon's mother, Bathsheba. Some commentaries have also suggested that these verses are descriptions of the Torah, Shabbat, and the soul, all of which have feminine names in Hebrew and thus assume some feminine attributes. Thanks, Bill. I also think it's so, um, this idea that we used to have fun every day, I think is such a touching idea, especially in the 18th century in a ghetto in Ancona, um, knowing that this kind of, you know, everyday joy is possible. And obviously that he missed her dearly when she died. So that, Prokit was constructed in several steps, some more laborious than others, um, but none really needed large scale specialized equipment. And this suggests that Simha probably was able to make this object even though it is quite large in her home. So this is an image from Diderot's Encyclopédie, which illustrates the tools necessary to complete a coupure style embroidery. So first the base fabric was stretched on a frame, which you can see on the image on the right. And then it was pounced or a design was temporary, temporarily applied by pouncing, which was you push chalk through pin pricks in a design. Then the wool and the felt and the vellum sections were applied. Uh, and then the final stage was really the silk shading. And so I'm gonna show you some details taken by our textile conservator, Miriam Murphy, um, that shows that the curtain is really a three dimensional object. Um, and you can see here the pearl, which are these spiraled wires that are then couched down to the surface of the fabric. So this is really covered in quite a lot of metal. It could have been, we actually haven't done an XRF analysis yet, but it could have been a variety of different kinds of metals. So a copper alloy with, you know, um, could have been gilt, it could have been solid gold or silver. So there's quite a lot of different materials that could have been used. But here you can see all these wonderful spiral, spiral wires, wires creating this um, sort of snaking texture. There are passing threads. So this is actually a, a core of silk or linen that's then wrapped in hammered metal. Um, and this creates a, a metal thread, literally, and that's then couched on the surface. There are strips of metal um, that are just applied to the surface rather than twisted around other um, core threads. And then finally, you can see some of the base um, fabric that's used to really build up the dimension of the object itself. So here is yarn and wool felt. Um, as you can see from these detail images, the curtain has sustained quite a lot of wear over its lifetime. And that was um, a point of concern for us when we were considering purchasing it. But the wear is sort of overall, it's, it's evenly dispersed throughout the object. And so we felt it really didn't deter from its overall beauty. And these objects are so rare and textiles in general, you really have to accept in most cases, some amount of um, compromised com conservation, I would say. So we did have also a debate, you know, shall, should we try to replace some of these lost threads or should we just further stabilize the curtain itself. And this is kind of an ethical 
concern when it comes to conservation. Of course, you can repaint, touch up paintings, um, but it's not typically done with textiles unless it's um, fashion. So there's somewhat of a different um, uh, philosophy when it comes to conservation of fashion versus textiles. So we decided to leave it as, as, as is without replacing, without replacing lost threads, but it's something that we could consider in the future. So a little bit about uh, the history of the region in which uh, Simcha lived her life. Uh, historical records tell us that by the 14th century, the city of Ancona, which is uh, shown with a big red dot uh, in the area marked the Papal States. All of those red dots, by the way, are ghettos uh, in, uh, uh, present day uh, Italy. So uh, uh, the city of Ancona in the 14th century uh, had established an organized Jewish community. Uh, the Jewish community, uh, like elsewhere in present day Italy, <clears throat> was comprised of three uh, primary cultural groups, Italianate, Sephardic, and Ashkenazic Jews. Uh, the Italian Jews trace their heritage back to the Roman Empire. The Ashkenazic Jews came from Southern Germany, Eastern Europe, and areas of France. And the Sephardim uh, largely arrived after 1492, fleeing persecution and eventual expulsion from Spain and Portugal. With them came increased trade with the East, thanks to familial networks established by Sephardic Jews across the Ottoman Empire. So it, it's important uh, in, the, in the story of Simcha that Ancona is on the Adriatic coast. Uh, it was a port city. Uh, and its history uh, periodically experienced various degrees of liberty and persecution for its Jews, uh, including uh, the wearing of discriminatory uh, yellow markers. In 1555, Pope Paul IV began to institute certain more severe anti-Jewish measures. Among other indignities, Jews were segregated into ghettos. They were prohibited from owning real property and they were confined to lower occupational op opportunities, such as trade in secondhand clothing. Despite this, in the 18th century, an Ashkenazi community also began to arrive. And as a result, Jewish Ancona became an unusually cross-fertilized community consisting of Italian, Sephardic, and Ashkenazi Jewish elements. So although these ghettos were really expressly prison neighborhoods, um, scholars like Dora Lesche Ben Parad, who's really the um, expert in Italian uh, synagogue textiles in Italy, have suggested that they also paradoxically offered security from what had been a constant threat of expulsion. And that this continuity of place, coupled with this forced isolation of diverse communities of Jews, fostered the growth of Jewish institutions, synagogue construction, and, ceremon and ceremonial art that I went and I quote, beyond ritual needs. So Jewish ceremonial <laughs> art includes, of course, textiles, but also metalwork, printmaking, and woodworking. And these Torah finials uh, on the left are the only other example of historic Judaica in Slam's collection. So we included them in the exhibition, uh, although we actively consider and pursue potential acquisitions um, made possible by this really generous fund set up by the Schatzes. Um, so these are actually Dutch. But the date roughly corresponds kind of mid to late 18th century with the date of the Torah art curtain. And indeed, aspects of the design correspond to Italian finials made around the same time. We also included this book from the Shimian Brisman collection at Washington University. They have a fantastic collection of rare Hebrew books. And you might have recognized this is the same title page that, that um, was owned by, or this is a title of a book um, that shares the same page uh, with one that was owned by Simha's father. So, so we decided to include this 
um, because it also nicely corresponds to uh, tour arc construction at that same time. So it's significant to note that in Italy, mostly Christians made synagogue metalwork uh, because Jews, for the most part, were not allowed to join guilds and thus could not practice metalworking or silversmithing themselves. And the same is true in the printing industry, so centered in Venice, mostly in Italy. Jews could not own printing presses themselves, but rather collaborated as typesetters and editors in the process. So this actually contrasts embroidery from the synagogue, which was designed and realized by Jewish women for Jewish people. And scholars really talk about how this is one of the only truly autonomous art forms of the ghetto era in Italy, and quite significant because of that. So documentary evidence suggests that precious textiles, including curtains, mantles, or covers, and wrappers had probably been in use in Italy from the Middle Ages in the context of the synagogue. So I include on the left an image from the Rothschild Mazur, which shows an early sort of Torah mantle, although its form is quite different from what we recognize as a Torah mantle today. In the 16th and early 17th centuries, embroidered synagogue textiles show a direct relationship to popular pattern books and tended to reflect domestic textiles like table covers and napkins. And I include this example, which was made by Livia Sapili in Ancona in 1672. So, um, you know, a little less, uh, less than a century before um, Simha's work. And it really has a direct relationship to the type of domestic textiles made in Italy and the Mediterranean at the same time. We also include this Dalmatic because we don't actually have any earlier synagogue, Italian synagogue textiles. So we used a, a Christian textile as a way to show this connection between Italian, um, Jewish and Christian textile arts at this particular moment. Um, so, the synagogue textiles become increasingly complex in the late 17th and 18th century, much like their counterparts, much like their Christian counterparts. And the exhibition, um, as I mentioned, includes this Dalmatic, which is really still brilliant, although faded from a much deeper purple. And the object and the nearby text, um, which is on the next page here, also borrowed from the Shimming Bersman collection, really highlights the important dialogue between and overlap of Christian and Italian decorative arts in Italy at this moment. So the fine interlacing bands on the tunics ground, which you can see in the upper right hand corner, they're called strap work. Um, it's cuffs and square central panel um, decorated with arabesques, which are dense patterns of kind of intertwined plants adopted from the Muslim world by um, European artists of the Renaissance are repeated also on Jewish textiles at the same moment. So this is a mappa from the Jewish um, Museum in Rome, and it also bears these same swirling arabesques and strap work. And these designs circulated in pattern books as well, beginning in the 16th century, and really were ever present on a great variety of decorative arts, including religious texts. So as you can see on the left here. Synagogue textiles were also frequently created in coordinated sets. And we know, thanks to the research of a colleague in Israel, that Viterbo actually embroidered a mantle in 1750 and a binder, a strip of cloth used to secure right, the World Torah Scrolls in 1758. And both of these are in a private collection. And unfortunately, the owners of them are not willing to share images. But it would be great one day if we could know what they looked like, because we could see her progress as an artist from when she was about 11. Um, so that would be really, really interesting. So uh, Simcha would have understood the centrality of Torah in Jewish life and practice. She would have known that the synagogue ark is reserved exclusively to contain the Torah scrolls, that it's a mitzvah to beautify the ark, and that the ark is placed on the wall of the synagogue where the worshipers face in the direction of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. All of these considerations would arguably have been important to her thinking in creating her Torah Ark curtain. Her work shows that she seemed to have a deeply understood understanding of the spiritual aspects of artistic creativity and the notions of addressing questions of faith through the prism of art. Torah Ark curtains are to this day prominently displayed within the architectural space of synagogues. They're known in Hebrew as paroket, 
a term which evokes the curtain described in the book of Exodus, which provided the required separation in the tabernacle between the holy, Kodesh, and the holy of holies, Kodesh HaKadoshim. The Hebrew word Kodesh literally means to set aside, but also means sacred. Since the end of the temple period, the use of Torah Ark curtains has evolved to separate the Ark from the synagogue's sanctuary. Division or separation is first described in the creation story in Genesis, where it is said that at the advent of the world or in the beginning, God initiated the first separations using the term Vayavdel, translated as, and he divided. The physical world came into being through a series of divisions, light and darkness, day and night, sea and land, animals and human beings. The Torah Ark Curtain provides such a separation between the Ark and the synagogue's gathering space. Jenny, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry, Bill, thank you. <laughs> it's a mute hazard. <laughs> um, so this is actually a picture of uh, an image of a painting that was sold in the same uh, auction as in which we bought the Torah curtain. And I, I was really pleased to be able to use it in some of my presentations because it shows, of course, some of these textiles in use, but then it also probably depicts the synagogue in the papal states because you can see that most of the men in the lower level are wearing yellow hats. And as Bill mentioned, this discriminatory practice. You can see the women in the elevated gallery, which is also um, interesting to consider the kind of the voice of Simcha in a space that she is not actually in herself. Um, and then these Christians in the lower left-hand side, uh, kind of interlopers, probably uh, scholars suggest coming to listen to the music uh, and observe the, um, uh, the ceremony of the synagogue itself. So uh, an interesting depiction. So I wanted to consider a little bit the relationship we diff between different artistic media in the context of the synagogue surface service. So you can imagine, you know, that these Rumonim are the Torah finials um, coming from the Hebrew word for pomegranate, you know, of course, if you want to decorating the top of the roller handles of the Torah, you know, what, what would they, they look quite different dressed with a mantle. Um, and so in a museum context, since we don't have a mantle, we couldn't show them like this, but we included this image on the label so that um, visitors who ha are not familiar with um, Jewish religious services or Jewish culture would understand what these finials looked like and how important they uh, the whole ensemble was with the textile and the finials together. And then also considering um, the bells themselves, drawing attention to the procession of the Torah um, and a reference to the you know, bells potentially on the um, high priest Aaron's robes um, and also potentially in the, uh, uh, embroidered with pomegranates. Um, so all of these wonderful illusions present in all of these different um, aspects of synagogue art at this moment. So the image on the right is uh, the exterior of the synagogue in Ancona, which I took on a 2019 visit. The Italian and Levantine synagogue now occupy one building in Ancona. So the Italian synagogue is a museum on the ground floor and the Levantine synagogue is um, is used by the Jewish community for services there. Uh, it was established in its present location in 1879. So the Italian synagogue includes um, including its Torah Ark and all of its textile furnishings and there's a, a very large inventory associated with it from the 19th century was moved to the ground floor of this building as I mentioned in 1933 after its 1635 building was demolished for an infrastructure project. 
So the image on the left shows the Italian synagogue's Torah ark before it was moved. Um, it boasts twisted helical columns and a broken pediment and silver requisite doors and side panels of floral garlands and has some relationship actually to, to the Torah curtain itself, um, I would suggest, especially these wonderful requisite doors, these sort of uh, very sort of um, overblown flowers and um, robust architectural details, particularly with the urns and the cartouches. Um, while austere on the exterior, the synagogue's interior, as you can see, mirrored the opulence and to some degree the design of nearby Baroque churches. And I think you can see this engagement with dominant Gentile culture was sort of tempered by our desire to create uniquely Jewish spaces of worship, a sensibility that I would argue is also evident in Viterbo's curtain. So the exhibition spends some time considering the really important labor of women in the ghetto, particularly in the secondhand textile industry. Um, and this explains to some degree why Simha at 16 would have possibly been able to make such a fantastic object, such a really highly skilled object. The bulk of Jewish Italian women worked and most but not all worked in the textile trade. So as expert menders, dressmakers, embroiderers, buttonhole makers, shopkeepers. About 40% of women earned the funds for their own dowries, which were substantially larger than their Christian counterparts. 70% of trades um, were composed of clothing and textiles. And so women's time scale and artistry in transforming merchandise, um, like mending, modernizing, embellishing, was really essential to the economic engine of the ghetto and represented this really uh, creative and productive enterprise. And I've included four quotes here to kind of help enliven, sort of paint a picture. Two are by, by non-Jews and two are by women themselves. Um, so that's also important to consider. So the, the quote on the, the lower left, um, I found that was really interesting. And this is from the research of Luca Andreoni. And this is from a woman named uh, Consola Cinquento who lived in Ancona around the same time that, that Simha lived there. And as you see, Consola had been used to assist in the shop of her husband, Gabriele. So, sh so she had acquired all the skills needed to, to negotiate the 300 scudi received by Cohen, who was an investor in their business, in the same genre as she did with her husband, that is new and old linens, lace, undians, half wool stockings, and others. So she was a, had all the skills necessary to, to negotiate alone. You know, she was an accomplished sto a shopkeeper and you know, was trusted uh, with her um, by her husband and used her own dowry to, as leverage to um, secure this loan. So also shows a really interesting uh, aspect of her own autonomy. And then here on the right, you see um, a quote from a woman from Turin from 1720 and how she says, right, that um, her dowry had been procured over several years with her sweat, labor, toil, and industries. Therefore, she disposes that in case she dies before her husband, nothing goes to her relatives, but everything remained in the pockets of the spouse. So she was able to actually dictate where her, where her dowry would go upon her death. Uh, and then in the top, we have two quotes, one from 1830 and one from 1713. So um, Bernardino Ramazzini is actually the father of occupational medicine, um, we would say. So he was interested in what kinds of ailments were associated with certain occupations. So he um, dedicates some time to talking about um, Jewish women, you know, they mended choosing old clothes, they earned their lives sewing busy all day long, and also during a part of the night under weak candlelight, poor lighting, and funeral lamps. So he, this was, uh, his concern it was about the diminishing eyesight of, of um, Jewish women and also arthritis in their, their fingers and hands. Uh, and then this is a description of the uh, Roman ghetto, which was a chaos of scraps and debris, the enti an entire world of shredded fabric. Um, so thinking about the diversity of objects and just the, the sheer quantity of textiles moving through Jewish communities at the time because of the importance of the secondhand textile industry. So in order to kind of think about why Simha's curtain looks the way it does, I looked through our own collection of textiles and said, okay, well, 
what kind of textiles might have been in Italy at this moment? What were the general trends in textile design and embroidery around the mid 18th century? Uh, what were the trade relationships like in Ancona at that moment? And we happen to have this great length of cut and uncut cut velvet, um, which sometimes is called a um, Genoa velvet for the um, city which made this type of fabric famous. So it's a polychrome, exuberant, Baroque floral design. It's this design was developed um, in the 17th century and became quite popular then, but persisted to be popular actually into the 19th century. And even today, people cover their furnishings with these kinds of Giardino, Giardino or Genoa velvets. Um, and they have a strong relationship to um, Baroque garden design of the same period. Um, so that's evident, for instance, in this engraving by Andre Molay. So this is a, a parterre de broderie, which is a, a type of very structured flower bed. Um, and you can see the kind of the, sim the symmetry, the stylization, the sort of overblown flowers. And to consider that there are many, many Torah art curtains made from these type of velvets in collections in Italy right now. So understanding that they were passing through Jewish communities in Italy at this moment, and that probably somehow would have been familiar with this design and thinking about some of the relationships to the design of her own curtain. I also wanna consider the influence of dress silks um, at the time. So in the mid 18th century, this is the high, po high point of Rococo naturalism in textile design. Mostly that was coming out of Italy and France, but uh, sorry, out of England and France, but it was also present in Italy. And so we have two great examples from Spitalfields, which is the center of the silk weaving industry in, uh, in England. And you can see the transition from 1720 to 1740, where you, in this skirt panel on the left, you see a much more structured and stylized approach to depicting flowers, but you're starting to get kind of a lightness that you didn't see right in these earlier velvets, which were more typically used for furnishing fabrics. And as it moves to this wonderfully naturalistic depiction of flowers where you can pinpoint the exact with, with botanical specificity, <laughs> the flower, you know, that's a tulip, this is a rose, this is a carnation, this is campanula, this is a uh, holly. And these were highly influenced by botanical illustrations that, and also botanical gardens that were um, cropping up everywhere. And these botanical illustrations were circulating around Europe and were very popular. And they appeared on textiles at the same time. And indeed, when you look at Sinhaut's curtain, you'll see very specific botanically accurate flowers. Um, and this makes a lot of sense because this is in 1755, and this is really the height of this moment of, um, of you know, naturalism and floral design. And here you can see some of these, uh, how it appears on lots of different elements uh, in the mid 18th century uh, within and outside Jewish culture. So here is a chasuble, um, which was, it's in the um, diocese, the collection of the Diocese of Ancona, probably made around the same time as Simha's Torah Art Curtain, and sharing some similarities, I would say, including this, this use of lambrequin, they're called, these are tasseled, uh, kind of tassel punctuated draperies, and somehow has sort of a suggestion of that at the top of her curtain. And then also these, you know, wonderfully naturalistic polychrome flowers, and these swirling, um, somewhat um, uh, intersecting bands of applied silver and gold ornament. And then you'll also see Ketuba uh, bearing wonderfully naturalistic flowers at this moment too. So Ancona was a major producer of Ketuba in the 18th century. And you see this one from 1722, the same design was used uh, 30 years later for another Ketuba in that public collection. And again, birds and flowers, carnations, really lovely and airy. And then here is a Torah arc, uh, curtain in the collection of the um, Jewish Museum in Rome, which you can see makes use of a fashionable dress silk um, and then has applied embroidery over it. Um, so you can kind of understand the sort of visual world at this moment and the interest in botanical accuracy. So here are a, cu a couple of other uh, uh, examples of uh, Torah arc curtains. Um, in Simha's time, textiles were extremely expensive and they were never thrown away unless they were completely worn out. Uh, they were recycled. Uh, so great care was taken to find ways to uh, add value and to create a thriving economy from these textiles. 
Some women, including Simha, took this one step further, creating sacred textiles for their Jewish communities. In Judaism, this practice has a special term, Ha'alah Bakadesh, the repair or perfection, rising into sanctity of a mundane object. This elevation may have been particularly important to Simha as an artist because it gave her creative opportunities as a Jewish woman in her community that went beyond economics, but went to her faith. There's a tractate in the Mishnah, Jerkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers, that says that we're not obligated to complete the work of creation, but neither are we free to desist from it. This idea of perfecting or improving the world suggests that each generation must do its work as far as it is able, and then pass the work on to the next generation, repeating the cycle until the ultimate goal of perfecting the world is achieved. The great 16th century scholar Rabbi Yitzhak Luria offered an important explanation of the need for this ongoing physical and spiritual repair. God, he said, created the world by placing divine essences into vessels. These containers could not hold the powerful essences of God and therefore they shattered. Rabbi Luria taught that there's a calling and a duty of the generations to tikkun alam, the repair of the world, whereby this brokenness is brought together and repaired. And in this way, the shattered is restored to wholeness. The Psalms speak specifically to the brokenness in the world brought about by the de destruction of the second temple by the Romans in the year 70 of the common era. In chapter 137, it states, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue stick to my palate if I cease to think of you. If I do not keep Jerusalem in memory, <clears throat> even in my happiest hour. The destruction of the second temple is often given as the reason why at Jewish weddings, even at moments of our greatest joy, we break a glass in memory of Jerusalem's brokenness. Simcha's artist, artistic creation of a Torah art curtain for her community's synagogue from a piece of secondhand material, enhancing it with beautiful embroidery, was in its own way an act of tikkun olam, a restoring to wholeness of a secondhand textile, allowing her to contribute to the repair of the world. So as Bill mentioned, um, like Venice, Ancona emerged in the 16th century as one of the first European cities to have a merchant colony from Ottoman territories, primarily composed of Greek and Jewish traders. So in the 16th century, the Ancona textile trade became very important and it extended from Lyon in the West to the Ottoman Empire in the East. And these trade connections really remained strong into the 18th century. And in 1732, this is a very key date for the history of Ancona, it was declared a free port and so this is a port that is open to captains or merchants from any nation, luring them with customs, free sale, storage, and re-export of goods. So this attracted quite a lot of new French and English traders in particular, in addition to um, the steady stream of Ottoman traders that had always been there. And it resulted in this influx of people and goods from across Europe, which you know, might explain some of the high style of her, of her curtain. So according to Luca Andreoni, from 1737 uh, to 38, um, the greatest number of ships with orders from Anconite Jews overwhelmingly came from Ragusa, which is present day Dubrovnik in Croatia, closely followed by Thessaloniki and it included tobacco, wool, raw cotton and textiles. So European traders are coming in and Jewish traders still continue to have these really, really strong ties with the Ottoman world. Um, and with the Balkans as well. That's quite an important part of the trade of, of Ancona. So it's instructive to consider what Simha's curtain has in common with those made uh, in the Ottoman Empire, as well as these more Western European influences. 
we were really lucky to be able to include this center, um, this central uh, prayer carpet in the exhibition. This uh, is a couple column prayer carpet. It's called um, made in you know in Asia Minor in Turkey in the 18th to 19th century. And it has a very distinctive design that probably does not have its roots in Ottoman culture, but in um, Jewish Spain. So it's thought by scholars like Vivian Mann and Walter Denny, that these couple columns which are not um, an aspect of Ottoman, Empire, Ottoman architecture before the 16th century, were probably brought uh, to Turkey via Jewish weavers who fled Southern Spain um, after the Inquisition, traveling through North, Northern Africa and landing in Turkey. And they brought with them their own traditions of, um, of design and that became incorporated into Islamic carpets of the same moment. And it's interesting to consider these other two carpets, not in the exhibition, but this tour art curtain, which is very, very similar to the prayer carpet uh, on the left, except for um, a few additional um, symbols. And then this carpet on the right, which is the earliest extant Torah curtain in Italy. And this was probably made in Egypt. It's a pile of carpet um, from the first quarter of the 16th century uh, that was imported into Italy. Uh, and so again, thinking about the really important aspect of um, Islamic carpet design on some of these Torah curtains at the same moment, and that also on the, the influence of the Jewish diaspora on these on these carpets themselves. And one thing to consider is that quite a lot of Torah curtains of this moment, um, including some of the ones that we've just shown you, do not have enclosed borders like Simha's. So Simha's actually reads a little bit more like a carpet with its enclosed floral borders, rather than sort of um, loose open borders, which is oftentimes what you would see more typically in the 18th century in Italy. So I also wanted to consider the potential impact of small scale embroideries made across the Ottoman Empire, which you know in the late 17th century um, included was just absolutely massive and <laughs> included North Africa, um, you know, parts of Greece and the Balkans, um, quite a lot of the Middle East, you know, it was, a, it was a gigantic empire. And we know that in the 17th century, little napkins like these uh, and um, um, sort of domestic textiles, this is actually a sash, but we have a napkin in the show as well, were imported along with coffee into the 17th century in Europe. So these types of Ottoman embroideries were already circulating in Europe. Um, before Simha made her curtain. And then to also think about um, the design of not just- uh, Can I talk? Carpet embroideries, but also- Bring her to me, bring her to carpet, me. Carpet, carpets, but also as um, embroidered to our curtains um, from the Ottoman Empire. So here you see one on the left, which has some similarities with Simha's actually. So right, these enclosed floral borders, uh, an attention to some naturalism, the flowers are a bit more stylized a sort of central flowering tree, even though it's a slightly different um, makeup and it shares obviously more in common with carpet design. I, I argue that, that, that probably these Eastern um, uh, embroidered textiles and pile carpets probably had a great influence on the design of Simha's curtain because of these really important ties with Ancona and the East. I also wanted to consider in this actually that the reason I did include this uh, wonderful Palampur, which was made in India for export to Europe and the exhibition, or I felt justified in including it, uh, was not, not just that it had this wonderful tree of life motif, but um, that if you remember, recall, Consola, when in her, um, uh, in her declaration that she was able to um, uh, support her husband's loan, mentions what her shop sold, and her shop sold Indian, which is actually a term for Indian textiles that were imported into Europe in the 18th century or European imitations of Indian textiles. So clearly in 1732 in Ancona, Indian textiles were circulating. And so I thought that would be interesting to include this object, which is a, again, a, a huge embroidered palampore with this wonderful tree of life motif, which um, itself is a combination of Chinese and Persian and European and Indian um, sources and probably used as a bed cover or sometimes wall cover um, and circulating throughout Europe at this moment and very, very influential in textile design of, of um, on European textile design in the mid 18th century. So kind of another, another element from slightly further afield. 
So we've uh, considered uh, the central motif, the grapevine. Uh, but what about Simcha's choice of a blue textile? Blue or tehillet is an important color in Torah. It's a symbol of sea, sky, and divinity. It can also represent equilibrium since its hue suggests a shade midway between white and black, day and evening. It shares a connection to the creation story. The medieval philosopher Maimonides likened Tehillet to the color of the clear noonday sky. Rashi, one of our most influential Jewish commentators, considered Tehillet closer to the color of a darkening evening sky. The three parts of the Shema, the Jewish confession of faith, is made up of three scriptural texts. The Tehillet is notably mentioned in the third text, where the Israelites are commanded to, to make tassels or tzitzit on the corners of their garments and to weave within these tassels Tehillet, a blue violet color. In addition, Exodus provides that the curtain separating the holy from the holy of holies shall be of a blue, purple, or scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen. In the Babylonian Talmud, Menachot 43b, Rabbi Meir said, what is different about Tehillet from all other types of colors? such that it was chosen for the mitzvah of ritual fringes. Why is blue different from all other colors? It is because Tehillet is similar to or resembles the color of the sea, and the sea resembles the sky, and the sky resembles the throne of glory. As it is stated in verse 13, and they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet the appearance of a paved work of sapphire stone and the likeness of heaven for clearness. In other words, Rabbi Meir hypothesized that the blue thread in tzitzit is meant to guide its wearers through a chain of associations, beginning with the immediate visualization of tzitzit and ending with the expansiveness of God. But why didn't Rabbi Meir simply say that the color blue reminds us of God's throne? Why do we first need to think of the ocean and then the sky? It seems Rabbi Meir was alluding to the intimate connection between our religious actions and the real world, and that our relationship with the divine must also encompass a relationship with the world that surrounds us, the ocean, the sky, and the rich variety of life that dwells in between, all the result of the divisions that God makes in the creation story of Genesis. To truly learn to see and thereby to know, we must consider the full world that God created, from the depths of the ocean to the heights of the sky and the vastness of earth. We stand before the ark with its curtain of blue facing Jerusalem, knowing that on the other side of the division is the Holy Ark and the Torah, the tree of life, the expansiveness of God. So when we stand close before the parochet, such as on the right, our vision tends to focus on the vine of grapes, the tree of life, knowing that the Torah is immediately on the other side of the curtain. When we stand back, we encounter Rabbi Meir's blue color field and the rich variety of life that dwells between sea and sky. Simcha's parochet invites us to experience her work of art as did the worshipers in the synagogue where the curtain was installed, from near and from further back, from different perspectives. This is one of the things any great artist would want us to do when viewing their work of art. It's what Jews around the world do as they honor, bless, and study Torah. 
Thank you, Bill, that was beautiful. Um, a perfect conclusion. So we would love to take questions if there are any. And I'll turn it over. I wonder if I should stop the share or if I should keep it. Yes, up. please stop the share and um, I'm coming on the screen here. So does anyone have questions? Um, Bill, do you have questions? Would it be possible? Let's see. We don't have any new ones in the chat. Can I? Yes, My name Liz. is Barbara. Sam. Oh, yes, Barbara. Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I just wanted to say how wonderful this presentation was. Um, we went to the museum the other day on Memorial Day to see the Nubian exhibit, but thought while we're there, knowing I was going to watch this program, we went down to see the textile uh, exhibition there. And I, I've been, I'm a lifelong St. Louis and I've probably been hundreds of times to the art museum and I never really looked at any of the textiles before. So my, my suggestion would be to try to get a little more prominence for this kind of display because it's down in the basement. I had to ask three people where it was. And um, it means a lot more to me now having listened to this, but I was still very impressed with it when, when we saw it there. And I had no idea that the museum had this kind of even collection of sacred textiles and so on. So I thought this was fabulous and I wish more people knew about it, is <laughs> my comment. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's a constant struggle. I have to say, um, I think the museum is moving in a direction where we're going to try to promote our smaller shows um, more than we have in the past. We've, we have such a huge focus on our special exhibition, which tends, which doesn't always include objects from our own collection. And so I think in the future, we're really going to try to bring some of these collections-based exhibitions to the attention of the public, because they're oftentimes in places that are hard to find. Um, in <laughs> <laughs> I, I, of course, I would love to move it upstairs. <laughs> I make requests, but I don't know. <laughs> um, then you have an audience. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Though. I'm really glad you enjoyed the show. That yes. means a lot. <laughs> Martin Weiss would like to know, was the cloth made on a hand loom or by a machine? Um, the silk satin in the back was probably made on a draw loom. Um, so by a weaver and a draw boy, um, possibly. Um, that's a, it's actually a pretty plain textile, so you, you wouldn't necessarily need a draw boy. But um, yeah, so made, made by hand on a loom. Mm -hmm. Judith, I have a question. Sure. What gallery is it in? It, it's in gallery 100. So when you walk in the main building of Cass Gilbert, um, so the old, the old um, building from SLAM, you, if you want to take the stairs, you can, right when you walk in the door, you can take a right and go down the stairs okay. and you'll see that gallery right away. Oh, okay. If you'd like to take the elevator, um, you go across, you know, and take the, the main elevator just to the right, and that will actually take you down and you'll have to kind of make a big tour, unfortunately. It's not, it's not super accessible via elevator. Um, you do have to kind of walk through the decorative arts or the African and Oceanic galleries in order to get to Gallery 100. Thank you. That's wonderful. Can't wait to see it in person. Okay. <laughs> Nadine says, thank you for such a wonderful, comprehensive an interesting presentation. Um, Susan asks, where were the Jews of Ancona textile traders, international trade or importing? So they, they were. Um, and that's interesting, right? Because the papal bull actually prohibits Jews from <laughs> trading in new textiles, but they made special exceptions for the Levantine traders of Ancona and evidently also the Italian traders. Um, Italian Jewish traders because Simha's father was probably a textile importer um, uh, of raw wool, maybe and tobacco. Um, so they were dealing in raw goods and in finished textiles. Um, unfortunately, the all we know is what was imported and not what was exported because of the limitations of the archive. Um, but economic historians have spent a lot of time thinking about um, especially the influence or the impact of the free port on, on trade within Ancona. Um, so that's a very interesting uh, point. More questions, comments? 
Stephen, would you like to say some things? I would, and it's not very often that and people who know me and are watching this will vouch. It's not very often that I'm lost for words, but this is truly one of those occasions where it was really such a privilege for us at the Merwitz Center and for all of the people who've participated today to be able to share this with you. I want to thank you both so sincerely and so profoundly for the gift that you gave us, not only to talk about a piece of art in a museum, but to contextualize it in such an informative and wonderful way. Um, I've seen this exhibit now multiple times, but I feel a need to go back one more time and in the context of what you've shared with us to appreciate it and enjoy it all over again. Thank you so, so much for doing what you did for us and thank you for making this available to us in St. Louis and at the Merowitz Center. <laughs> well, thank you, Stephen. Before we go, we do have one more. Um, actually, um, uh, Rabbi Miller. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, I guess my, my really just a very simple question: If there was a uh, if there was a book uh, that you could uh, recommend for the for the for the lay uh, the lay art enthusiasts who about you know, the the interaction between uh, the Jewish uh, <coughs> Jewish uh, traders and artists um, with other with both with Christian and Muslim the Christian and Muslim world through the through the, all these different trade routes um, and how that may have influenced the the art of of cities like uh, the art of the Jewish communities like Ancona. Well, what what would you recommend? Yeah, I'm sure there's 30 books. I'm sure there's 30 <laughs> books to read, but if, we had, if there was one that you could yeah. direct, but well, the this great, is wonderful. Think, yeah, well, thank you. That's a good question. Um, so the, the great book on Italian Judaica is called Gardens and Ghettos, and that um, was part of an exhibition from the late 80s that was curated by Vivian Mann at the um, Jewish Museum in New York. She's you know, a, a, a titan in the field of the history of Judaica. Um, that talks a little bit about the, these relationships across the Mediterranean and the influence of um, Jewish people or the relationship between Italian Jewish communities and those elsewhere. Um, Luca Andreoni focuses a lot about that in his dissertation, which is pretty dry. <laughs> I'm sure I'd recommend it as a, uh, as a, but Vivian Mann also has done a series for Brill. Uh, which includes, she has a great book about, um, or a great chapter, I should say, in a book um, about uh, Sephardic textiles um, and across uh, North Africa and Spain and um, the Levant, which is really, really interesting too. Um, I have to say, so there's a, there's also inter an interesting book about um, Donna Gracia, I want to say her name is, I'm going to mess this up. You all, you know her, she's famous, <laughs> uh, of an earlier era. So there's not as much on the 18th century, I have to say. It's more focused on the 15th and 16th century, the, um, the, these books about the kind of dialogue between um, Christian and, and Muslim and um, Jewish worlds in the Mediterranean at this moment. So right me, um, a, uh, maybe a recommendation. If you could send me a couple of those book recommendations in an email mm -hmm. later, mm -hmm. and then I can forward them to everyone in the event that they would like to check those out or look at yeah. them. Okay. Also, um, nice. if, if it's useful, I could also, um, I have a series of articles that I've um, gotten over time. So I could also share those quite easily. They're just PDFs okay. some are in Italian, but some are not. And, um, and they're pretty readable, I have to say, particularly the girl. Okay. So yeah. Great, okay, great. Well, again, thank you so very much. This was very delightful and very informative. And, you know, it just makes you like, as Stephen said, want to go back to the museum <laughs> to, you know, with new eyes, look at some of the art and the textiles. So thank you again, you and Bill. Thank you so very much. And I think we'll have to end for today. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Bill. Bye, everyone.